Thank, thank you, Joel. It's enormous delight, privilege, and honor to be with you all, to have spent some time getting to know some of you. I hope I'll still have some time to get to know more of you and to learn so much. So I want to offer my thanks to all of you at the DeBar Conference planning for inviting me. Um, it's humbling to be here, and I won't uh, drag this out. Just know my thanks is very deep indeed, so thank you. I want to offer some thoughts this evening on the way any theology of the Holy Spirit might, or perhaps even should, be related to the reality of human life, that is, to the life of a human being understood as a creature of God. Uh, these thoughts that I'm going to offer have very little to do directly with the questions that we've been dealing with, like the historical Adam. Uh, but they do touch, I suppose, on matters of mortality and theodicy, certainly, maybe even original sin in some very practical way. Um, as you'll see, I think some of what I have to say is related to things that John Kilner uh, spoke about this morning, uh, although as he spoke about the basis upon which we might value other people's lives, uh, Imago Dei, I'm going to be talking about why an individual might value his or her own life, especially in the midst of a world, a context in which all the things our valuing of other people's lives might be hoped to achieve often don't happen. These thoughts come out of a book I've recently finished writing in draft form on what I call pneumatology. And I say what I call pneumatology because obviously the term pneumatology is well established. Uh, it's not mine, it's fairly straightforward in its meaning. Or is it? And that's been my question. Because the argument I've been working on um, is one that asserts that pneumatology is actually a modern invention, taking distinct form only in the 17th century, and finally reordering the previously traditional theology of the Holy Spirit in a new way and in a way that I believe is ultimately subversive of a useful and truthful understanding of human life as creaturely life, as life made by God. And the standard category of pneumatology that we deploy today, and I teach courses called pneumatology and so on, is in fact impregnated, even in its most traditional applications, with this modern subversion of the creature. Implicitly. Modern pneumatology, that is, has helped stoke the sense that being a creature, just as God has made us or even allowed us to be in our fallen state, uh, but also simply wonderfully made because God has made us, modern pneumatology has helped stoke the sense that being a creature such as this is not enough. Now tonight I'm not going to go into this mostly historical argument regarding pneumatology's invention and its anti-creature impetus. For now I'll simply say that the rise of pneumatology, as I've tried to understand it, is tied to the same forces that fed into the rise of theodicy. That is to say the social awareness of overwhelming suffering that makes itself felt in early Western modernity. A world turned upside down, using Christopher Hill's phrase for 17th, 17th century England. Instead, I want to share, I'm not going to talk about that, but instead I want to share some of what I believe are the moral stakes involved in this argument. And to me, these arguments are very personal, and I'm going to be a bit autobiographical, both personally and intellectually, in what follows. I believe that one of the greatest challenges that our culture has posed, and I speak here of North America and much of Europe, is the question of life's worth. Why live at all? That's actually a new question uh, in a broad way, shared by many, that is, in the history of humanity on a cultural level, as far as I can tell. Why live our lives from birth to death with a steady commitment to carry on? and with a sense of hope in just this life, not only in something else beyond it. Many people today not only would not know how to answer such a question articulately, but have had the potential answers to such a question undermined in a profound way. 
In other words, modern pneumatology, as it has developed over the past few centuries, this has been my argument, is linked with many of the social confusions and despairs that inform not only family disorder, but our church's debates, conflicts, and finally, disintegrations. Now, of course, for many people, the choice to live seems so obvious as to recede into the shadows of simple existence taken up in an unapologetic energy, uh, or at least without concern. And yet, for others, what seems obvious is, in fact, a struggle, and often a terrible one. And whether or not this struggle is more common in our day and in our culture than in the past or elsewhere, it's probably impossible to tell. But in any case, our culture and era in North America, in Europe, in the 21st century, have certainly made the decision over living into something that is now thrust upon people as a demanded judgment they must make. In fact, to be made over and over again. Not only are the elderly and the ill now faced in many countries with the legal possibility of ending their lives, but the fraught economics of medical care and social assistance have created an environment of constant calculation over life. How much will it cost to stay alive? What kind of burden will this amount to for my family? What options are offered by this or that form of insurance? And thrown into this calculating mix are the ever-present realities of pain, which in the new social frameworks of monetary appraisal have become a determining factor in a way that was never the case in previous eras. Suffering is now a quantifiable entity, stacking up alongside savings accounts, insurance regulations, and the store of family energies that together define the task of what I call now elective existence. In fact, elective existence as a political economic reality is now being thrust upon the cultural and interior consciousness of younger generations, younger people. In societies of state-sponsored assisted suicide, teenagers, as you know, are now being included in the cohort of the, quote, intolerably suffering, a group defined by elements bound up with the larger social arithmetic of drugs, personnel, regulation, and relational capacity. A 16-year-old suffering from severe depression in Belgium, Holland, soon in Canada, can elect to be killed. Mental anguish and confusion are now weighed against the, quote, competencies of youthful decision-making. And life is given over now to the purity, so it is claimed, of autonomous human judgment. Perhaps this result constitutes but a clearer version of what has always been the case in a world marked by violence and warfare, where decisions for life or against it were constantly given over into the hands of creaturely de decrees, corvées, military drafts, slavery, fair enough. Yet the cascading sense today among so many young people that they must become the judges of their own life's worth is manifest in a driven need as many sociologists have been tracking and articulating, to seek confirmation among others, to escape the burdens of their own place, to remake themselves over and over, and finally, in the face of this load, perhaps to find solace in withdrawal. So the old are now told that they must choose to live or die, and the young, detached from the confidence, let alone perseverance, of their elders, are left to determine the value of their being according to some now unknown and unexampled standard. As I said, this is a very personal issue for me. Without being overly confessional, suffice it to say that my own family has struggled with these questions very deeply and extensively. When I was a teenager, my mother committed suicide, as did later one of my sisters, and I could go on. And as you can imagine, this kind of struggle affected my own sense of self, of worth, of life, and dragged me down deeper and deeper uh, over many years into a cavern of sorrow. Furthermore, the very person that in part I was mourning, my mother, let us say, had somehow determined to delete from my landscape the very model by which I might have navigated my loss. 
determined decision to die is always, for someone else, the opening up of a door to emptiness. With much anguish, I had to make my choice to live. And I had to do so over and over again. And furthermore, it was now in a world I never expected to know as a child, one where again and again, I was asked to choose in an exhausting movement from year to year. So when I look at what younger people are facing today and look at what is said about what it means to understand their own worth at age 14, 13, 18, 25, that's but a projection for me of something that seemed to have been concretized and, 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 and rooted down in the depths of one's soul in a concentrated form uh, much earlier. Now socially shared <laughs> in a kind of funny way. But you see, I believe that ought not to be a human responsibility. But it is now. Now, none of this is easy for me to talk about, let alone in a context like this among people, most of whom I don't know well. But in this era and in this place, I do not believe we can afford to bracket, let alone excise, the models for such a choice, even if the decision itself seems so novel in the spread of its insistence, or perhaps just because of that. I now have children of my own, born of that most unexpected intimacy of spousal friendship. It is not so much that I decided to give them life. That itself is a novel notion, at least in human culture as far as I can understand it. As it is that my life is the basis of their own, and now theirs of mine. Call it the epiphany of genealogy. And we've been talking a little bit about that, but that's one reason I wanted to bring this down to earth a little bit. Epiphany of genealogy. And I consider it to be the most heart-filling and heart-rending reality I have been permitted to encounter. And I feel lucky for that. But the point is we can't disentangle ourselves from the lives of others, as Josh said, said yesterday. Even death, you see, can't achieve that. This impossibility, in fact, exposes an obvious responsibility that one should rightly extend to the network of our families, generations, and communities. We are now forced to choose to live, and if we are, then I must make my choice for living an open one, at every step and in every place, for I am not my own. Furthermore, just because the choice and its responsibility are now being thrust upon us culturally in novel ways, we must confront the reality of what made these choice or this kind of choice necessary. And this forces us to see things whether we like it or not and to measure things in ways that are necessarily confusing and disorienting. Here we come to the theodicy issue. I can say that by God's mercy I am alive. And I am able to choose this life. And I was able to navigate all the things that might have made such a choice a, a difficult one or an impossible one. And I affirm that by God's mercy. Yet simply by making this statement or sensing its conviction, I throw the consequences of that grace into an arena where it can be questioned by others, compared, held up in proportion to the lives uh, of other people and the choices they have made. That is to say, why can I make this choice successfully, but not others? We see around us, once our eyes are attuned and directed, fields of inequities and divine disproportions, mercy seemingly offered and seemingly withheld. That's the modern theodicy question. When all the doorways of life are opened up to view, let's say doorways in which one can choose to enter or not, the world simply looks different than before. That perspective is perhaps a personal one, but it's probably also one that's a shared bequest of contemporary vision more, more broadly, now that elective existence has become a formal legal norm in many of our societies. Now, I don't have any special insight into this cultural moment, but I do observe how young people in an increasingly self-conscious fashion are facing into the shape of the world's ordering in ways that constantly uncover necessarily this threshold, these doorways of life's choices, choosing to live. They are asked 
by the chaotic unraveling of social and familial commonalities, as well as by the legal requirements to accept this chaos, to define and certify, I just give you a partial list, their hidden desires, to establish the value of their uncertain labors, to con co confect the responsibilities of created friendships, to adjudicate forms of procreation and generation, to determine the scaffolding of human well-being, to select their place within a crowded and disordered human and even non-human universe. And suffering, in fact, becomes one of the few common features of existence. Yet, you see, now left to be engaged like some intransigent but otherwise inexplicable encounter. It has no common meaning. Young people and many older folk have no common standard for valuation here, you see. The numbers that add up to worth, my life is worth living, seem too often unsteady and incommensurable with the inrushing data at hand and all the comparisons one can make with everybody else who has to choose at the same time. There are many ways to numb the confusion to sink into it, or let it simply carry one along, or to push against it, or finally to walk away through these open doorways of life's threshold. I hope you are aware of the most recent statistics on suicide in the United States, released just in the last few weeks, literally. In some demographics, like young girls and women, there has been a literal doubling of suicide rates in the last decade alone. And there's been an overall 30% increase over the last two for everybody. But this is not just the curious sideshow of somebody complaining about his past. Now, For my part, I struggled as a young person to search for models for staying put in life. And now I'm moving into the intellectual aspect of this. Models for staying put in life, but ones that by definition would be realistic and truthful, as I saw it, to the now exposed world that I had suddenly been uh, forced to, to confront, in which I chose also as a result and was granted the grace to choose to stay. Theologically, as I grew up and, and made my way into this world of, of, of academic and scholarly thinking and so on, I turned it not to an explanation of suffering or of evil, not, not really the theodicy question, but to the uncovering of some more fundamental solidity and integrity to the world, where such explanations, in any case, didn't seem ostensibly purposeful. My own choice to live was not one bound, in any case, to a calculation, which theodicy often ends up trying to construct. I barely knew the why in the wake of my family's upheaval, only the that. So it was the that of life that I, without thinking perhaps consciously, chose to pursue. The presupposition that might govern the case that my life is a life to live in any situation. That's what I was sort of after. I'd been given life, given life by God, I felt, more than once. And my choices were secondary at best. I wasn't looking for a calculating way to choose it. My initial turn then was pneumatological. I'd gone to live and work in Africa, for instance, and I was impressed by the reality of divine impulsion in the world that I was living in. Something that simply was, and therefore could be used as a datum that resisted calculation's control, since calculation seemed to be getting everywhere in different places. I looked for examples of courage, strength, openness, perseverance and joy among individuals and communities, especially in the midst of enormous pressures and, and, and burdens, people of extraordinary love, extravagant hope and self-offering, patience across spans of time that I now knew were themselves frightfully unpredictable, steadiness in the face of fire and disregard. I sought to grab hold of such models and of what might inform them and, and to run with what I uncovered. The Holy Spirit seemed to be just this founding impulse, as I believe it is, by the way, for everything I'm, I'm, I'm going to say. And I set about trying to understand how this might be so. Over the years, I collected literally piles of notes on the Holy Spirit. 
in witness, historical testimony, liturgical adoration, theological discussion, philosophical speculation. I prayed with others. I sought to open my heart to pneumatic welcome and expression. I scoured human experience in Africa to the ancient world, from Asia to the inner city, for images of the spirits underlying, sustaining, and often explosive self-manifestation that would somehow ground life's worthiness. Now, I've discovered two things, at least, in the course of what has now been over 30 years of reflection on this topic, however limited my capacities for it might be. The first thing I have discovered is the world's stubborn imperviousness to sorting this out consistently. The givenness of life, that life is something we are handed in our existence and that we engage through some panting press to the end. The givenness of life is surely fundamentally bound up with the Holy Spirit. But this too often difficult givenness is precisely what has driven us to speak out the Spirit's impulsive consistencies in the first place. If the world or even the church is pneumatically charged, it is not so in such a way that the pieces of that world fit together well. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking for the thing in the first place. We're always looking. We're always choosing. The world of the Spirit is a world where all the doorways leading away from life remain on view, remain open and compelling at this or that time in this or that place for this or that person. I know that. We cannot make this world over by asserting the Spirit's truth. And therefore, the Spirit's truth must find its articulation just here in the world where life appears and disappears, lightly or in anguish. We can call that pneumatic realism. But pneumatic realism means, in a sense, there's no calculating the Spirit's establishment of our being. So when I came to write on the Spirit initially, I had wanted to investigate the binding power of pneumatic grace in the world, something that might hold life together in the midst of whatever forces uh, would unwind its fibers. So I focused on a theological ecclesial movement, Jansenism, an early, modern, mostly French, Catholic, Augustinian renewal movement, think Pascal, for whom the impulsive power of grace was their central conviction. And I turned to one of the great episodes of miraculous healing in the modern era, the 18th century prodigious cures that took place around the tomb of the saintly Jansenist François de Paris. These miracles were numerous, witnessed by many, and documented in detail by doctors and lawyers, the great scientists of the era. The miracles, however, of Saint-Médard proved to provide little clarity regarding pneumatic action and reality. Instead, in fact, they gave rise to relentless and often wrenching conflict and consistation. And in the end, the miracles were officially by the church and state rejected as demonic or at best deluded, and those who promoted them were arrested, driven away, or pressed into increasingly bizarre reactive postures. Protestant observers, for their part, tended to mock all sides in the affair. This is one of the great episodes. There's tons of documentation and everybody wrote about it in Europe at the time. By the end of the episode, which dragged out over many years, local and national churches were more divided, healing seemed more transient, and the spirit more veiled. And this turns out, from one perspective, to be a constant theme in Christian life. Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. I came to send fire to the earth to give division. And oddly, this view of pneumatic reality uh, uh, and what pneumatic reality accomplishes is a familiar, if cynical, claim of many non-Christians. Enthusiasm, we're told, ruins everything. And sometimes it actually does. <laughs> Pursuing the spirit led me back, that is, into the world, which the search for the spirit was meant to make sense of in the first place. The world, that world, remained as opaque as ever, with its scattered graces 
and widespread darkness. Only it was now a world, the very world, where Jesus, such as he is, was sent and gave his gifts. That was a pneumatic conclusion. And while it was a conclusion that should not have surprised me given my intuition regarding the need for any investigation of the world's value to be realistic, it was a disappointment to me of sorts. Because the second thing that I learned in my study of the Holy Spirit is that just this world where Jesus is sent and gives away his gifts is one that the study of the Spirit has been steadily and with increasing insistence denying for centuries. My disappointment, that is, was, uh, was in part born of unconscious, if inadequate, pneumatic expectations. The book I've just written is a small effort to trace these misplaced expectations, and I now simply offer the prod of its aim for your consideration without any elaboration. The motive of my analysis, however, has been my growing sense that the expectations themselves are somehow caught up in the very dynamics that have defined the contemporary demand to choose our lives, to decide for them and thus judge them. Modern pneumatic expectations have not caused these demands, but they have reflected them. Ours is a world, I believe, a life, where the Holy Spirit does not remove our physical limitations. It does not remove the barriers to our hopes, present fulfillments, or remove the rejection of our desires, or remove the grating and often sharp edges of our losses and suffering. That world, such as it is, is of course also a world, often though not for everyone, filled with gleaming wonders. But this glorious astonishment and distressed suffering at best coexist in our world. They do not integrate into some third entity of transfigured being in this life. In the end, both come up against the fact of our final loss of all things that we know in crossing the threshold of our deaths. However we consider life today to be as created or fallen, we leave it all behind. One does not need to decide the question raised in our talks here about whether Adam and Eve might have lived forever without sin, nor does one need to reject Paul's clear sense that death, as we experience it, is the product of sin and not God's will. My point is simply that in a fallen world, we physically die and lose all, though God promises a new creation. And the Holy Spirit, therefore, is not some entity that saves us from this reality of this kind of life and death. And whether fallen or not, this kind of life and death are still God's, and thus utterly and incomprehensibly valuable. And that's the challenge to try to get those two together. Pneumatology as a theological discipline, I have argued, is a modern invention. The word itself and the category it designates, pneumatology, and the questions and tools it uses emerged only in the 17th century, basically, to identify a reality that could join human being and divine being in a mode of existence that was other than and ultimately beyond the world of flesh and blood, birth and death, that constitute human creaturehood as we experience it. Pneumatology, I'm speaking purely historically now, was a category originally that referred first to spirit as a mode of non-creaturely being, non-creaturely in the sense that human beings experience creatureliness. It did not refer to the Holy Spirit in a special way. That's the point. The Holy Spirit became appropriated to this world escaping ontology that pneumatology designated. And then contaminated by this ontology, as it were, these pneumatic ideas infected subsequent dogmatic and theological discussion of the Holy Spirit. You probably want to know who I'm talking about in this. And the story I tell is recondite for some. Moves from Paracelsus to Giordano Bruno through Quakerism, through Hume and Herder, to people like Walt Whitman. But it also includes very orthodox theologians like Henry Moore, uh, Owen, Wesley, Westcott, and many others. 
Over 400 years, pneumatology as a category developed into the formal, let me go back, it developed into the formal theological discipline of pneumatology as we know it today. But you see, that was only in the 1970s, really. The word is used here and there before that to refer to the Holy Spirit as a discipline, but very rarely. Through the Second World War, the term pneumatology only occasionally referred to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, pneumatology was about psychology, ideas, consciousness, godlikeness, divine ethers, oceanic destinies, somatic transformations, angels, electricity, and on and on. You can look all this up. Uh, Andrew, Edinburgh, and, and I don't know, St. Andrews, they had chairs in pneumatology. Hume wanted one, he didn't get it, and he was ticked off. But what were they studying there? They were studying what today we would call moral theology and psychology. And sometimes they were studying things like chemistry. That's what pneumatology was. Pneumatology, that is, was until recently about how the world materially, existentially, isn't really what it seems to be. Bodies that, born, that are born and die. And I think that proved to be horrendously misleading. Especially as this whole set of concerns infiltrated Christian notions of what it means to be a creature who is fragilely and sexually conceived, who struggles, who loves and loses and dies, all because of, and despite sin, the marvelous grace of God. We do all this because of God's grace. The pneumatological expectations deriving from the category's modern invention, though, have misled us into making us think that the world as it is, as a creation by God in all its intrinsic mortal limits, even in its fallen state over which he cares, is without hope unless and until it is left behind and all becomes spirit in an inclusive, limitless affirmation. I don't think that's what Paul's discussion of the resurrection is about. And in this way, pneumatology, as it has been invented and developed over the past three or four centuries, is the mirror of modern nihilism, running from the ripples of the fearful mortal body. The great French-Romanian pessimist, and that's who he called himself, Emile Surin, has written, everything exists, nothing exists. One or the other formula brings a similar serenity. The anxious man, to his misfortune, is stuck between the two, trembling and perplexed, always at the mercy of a nuance, incapable of fixing himself in the security of being or in the absence of being. That's nihilism, everything or nothing which Christianity is indeed in the middle, this fearfully perplexed position where nuances count for everything. For Christianity, it's not everything or nothing. It's some particular thing, this. Sin and all, it's this. What those who choose to live require, getting back to my opening, and it seems to me we are all asked to choose today, what we require is not another world, but the finality of a choice for this world that somehow stands beyond and beneath our decisions, not only as an enabling power or an inspiration, which the Holy Spirit certainly is, but as a revelation, as an establishment. What we require, that is, is an amen to our life in its very utterance that establishes its worth in the face of all that clamors for its inadequacy. And such an amen we know is a person, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the beginning of the creation itself. An amen who comes, who speaks and teaches, who lives as a creature and does indeed die as one in particular ways and forms, and in so doing takes to himself what is just this life as it is created and so oddly laid out and deformed by us, to be sure, but nonetheless in the heart of God. Those who choose to live require first the choice that God has made to live this life that they were given. 
And so I confess, there is no other model, figure, form, or truth than the incarnate person of Jesus Christ. So if the Holy Spirit does not resolve the world as it is, and I think demonstrably, existentially, we were talking yesterday, somebody raised the point about existential adequacy as a criterion for our theological, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, the, the Spirit demonstrably does not resolve the existential realities of our life as we live them. If pneumatology, uh, if the Spirit doesn't do that, and if pneumatology has mistakenly insisted that that's at the center of what the Spirit does, we must move more deeply into the world itself and into the primary choice for the world that God has made and in the way that God has made it in Christ. We shall there discover the form of that choice as that which is therefore most truly of the Spirit. So on this basis, I've slowly altered my sense of the pneumatological, I have to use the word, foundations for theology. Such foundations, I now think, must resist theories, metaphysical frameworks, and instrumentalist promises and fantasies. They must instead approach the spirit as the God who establishes the world as it is, such that the form of life that Jesus lived and died within it is of God, utterly. Of course, the world changes. We know that. It will, we can assume and imagine, someday even disappear. While we can assert the Spirit's life is somehow wrapped up with all this change, wherever it's going, the purpose of pneumatology cannot be to specify the ways of transformation as such. That is why I believe pneumatological attempts at linking the Holy Spirit to evolution, Charles Raven, earlier 20th century, Teilhard de Chardin, but many others. Various forms of radical process theology and quite traditional claims about it. That's why I believe these attempts are profoundly off the mark. Just such intractably unspecified change is part of the world we cannot fathom, nor are we meant to, and in fact drives too many to run from it altogether. Rather, pneumatology, austerely chastened, as I would like to imagine it, is like philosophy not meant to change the world, but to speak truly of what it is. In theological terms, to speak truly of the world's worth and of human life's worth, precisely given in the life lived by the Son of God. It is not for me to offer an apology for life. God already has, such that I can only wonder that I am worthy of it and must certainly confess that such a life, therefore, is enough. In conclusion, I want to suggest that any contemporary theological anthropology resists the allures of modern pneumatology. And that any theology of the Holy Spirit tie itself to the forms of human creatureliness in the way our Lord did, very specifically. There are dogmatic reasons of truth, I think, for doing so. But there are also the deep demands of compassion that dictate such parameters. And dogmatics and compassion, I think, are two sides of the same valuable coin. Thank you.